Hi everybody, uh, my name is Jamie, um, I'm going to apologise straight off the bat, I'm Glaswegian, so if you don't understand my accent, just put your hand up and I'll repeat what I said. Um, so yeah, as I said, doing bug bounties, crowdsourcing, nosy bastards, it's quite hard to make a title about bug bounties, and this talk's different from other ones you might have seen about bug bounties, because it's going to be more about the management of bug bounty systems. Um, it is a part of, it was a part of my literature review from a master's dissertation, however I've transitioned away to a different topic. Um, so it might not be the best, but I can say this talk is going to be at least better than the end of Game of Thrones. Um, or at least I'll try to. So I'm going to kind of make a kind of assumption that you know what bug bounties are, you get monetary awards for disclosing vulnerabilities responsibly. Um, and we're going to start off by comparing bug bounties to the methods that we use to submit and track mundane bugs. So your imperfections and the kind of stuff you see on bug tracking systems. So going forward, we compare bug tracking to the bug bounties. There's one thing they both share, and that's motivation. It's intrinsically motivated. You are submitting vulnerability reports for the betterment of a system, be it for, for monetary um, reward or not. But the extent of which the intrinsic motivation goes varies between um, the the two different types here. Um, we'll get on to that later. Uh, but there's two major differences, and we're starting off with transparency. Bug tracking systems, you'll find them on mail, mail lists and on public forums. Um, it's to kind of help duplication. And you don't see this on um, bug bounties because it's quite obvious it's security flaws, you don't want them being out in the public. But this transparency, as I said, kind of has a knock-on effect with duplication. In bug tracking, they do want to get duplicates However, in uh, bug bounties, duplicates are basically kind of like the I've got a boyfriend of um, bug bounty reporting. It's a really hot <laughs> it's like rejection on the top level. Um, so this kind of leads on to our first kind of problem, this duplication problem, which is called the information mismatch. Oh. So this comes from economic theory, this mismatch term. Um, we'll get onto a bit more economic theory later. But it basically boils down to we know what people want, but we don't provide it. And this kind of shortcoming to get around what people want is the problem. So if we look at the want, we've got a handy dandy ISO that was updated last year, um, which gives you what you should put in a vulnerability uh, report. This includes, of course, location, steps to reproduction, uh, POC, with media, impact and severity, Types of vulnerability, root causes, disclosure plans, data discovery. All this helps towards um, the you know, people who get the bug reported to them to resolve it faster. Um, and it is shown in surveys, in academic surveys, and in their market material for the big bug bounty systems, to talk about Hacker One and Bug Crowd. This leads to um, faster resolution of bugs. Not mentioned in ISO, but still great to include, are these additional ones that I put myself. So supporting references isn't mentioned as much in um, the ISO, but it is kind of just a little bit of footnote. And then you've also got potential countermeasures, but of course bug bounties, you don't really know what's going on behind the curtain, so you can't give that all the time. Good manners, cost nothing, don't be a dick. That's kind of self-explanatory. And then finally, Grammarly Premium. Now I've put this in here as a hope to try and get a sponsorship off of Grammarly, because it's really good. But also because it kind of gets to a point that um, easier to read vulnerability reports are actually resolved faster as well. I know it sounds quite self-explanatory, but it is something that comes up in academic surveys quite a bit. But we don't live in this kind of um, perfect world where we'll get what we want. Um, the inform information mismatch exists, so you don't get that, you'll get the got. So the got's got the void of details, which... Self-explanatory. You've got beg bounties, which is quite a funny term. So that's like people doing bug bounties and thinking they found a vulnerability or they found a very mundane vulnerability that can't be really exploited and it's not worth um, going through all the castle. But they'll beg for money. And then a more escalated version of this is blackmail. Obviously, this happens a lot more in bug bounties because the monetary um, reward in it, you can kind of use that. So that's what happened with Uber with their uh, 10k maximum. They got blackmailed at 100 grand basically. And then lastly, which is quite a sad kind of thing, is um, foreign languages. It's just kind of sad reality of the worldwide kind of um, reach of bug bounties. It's infeasible to hire people that speak all the major languages 
to then, who can do all the vulnerabilities, to then triage them and then send them to the companies and make sure they're valid. Um, we're moving on to the worldwide and how it hurts the overall community. Uh, both major platforms have about over 300,000 um, accounts from over 100 companies. And then I've kind of picked a couple out. So you've got India, uh, which has got about 30% of the population of a full ecosystem on just one, um, on for one uh, platform. And then I've picked out Egypt and Argentina. I picked out these because these have the um, 17.6. 25.2 and 40.6, which are the, the kind of uh, multiplication of what the median wage for a software engineer is. This is a bit of a weird market, and I'm not really fond of it myself, because this fixation on money earned by individuals and bug bounties isn't taking into account the reality of bug bounties. Not everybody can afford fancy blue cars and go driving around them and put them on Twitter. Um, the facts over here on the left kind of point this out. So you have the average payout for a vulnerability is about $500. That includes all the way from your critical ones to your just mundane ones. Then you have only a 1,000 hackers on this one platform have earned over £5,000 or $5,000. Now, obviously, this goes further in places like India than it does in America. Um, so you have to count for that in this data. And then over 100 hackers, so a tenth of them have earned over hundred grand, and two hackers have earned over a million. So this is one platform where 300,000 people and only two people have earned over a million. And this is with about 14.4% of that population working full-time. Now, if you break down the numbers, it means that 97.5% have never received a bounty, have never been able to sell a vulnerability to one of these platforms. And that's quite a scary fact when you have 3,000 or you think there's 300,000 people hacking into you, but there's not. The glimmer of hope is of the largest companies that have bug bounties so far, only 6% have at the 4, 000, or Forbes 2000. But if this keeps on growing, is it necessarily a good thing? Is or do more eye, more eyes mean the better? And the answer is no. Um, the academic surveys have kind of found out there's a power law, but I'm going to put my hands up. I got in and out of my maths class at school, like a bank job. I was in and out, never cared, so I don't really understand what power law means. But I think it's something like there's a critical mass or there's like a, a point where it alters and basically means that if you get too many people looking at your uh, website and doing the bug bounties, it's too many reports which then has a knock-on effect for the implementation and the, of the resolution. You have too few participants, then you'll have very narrow coverage of vulnerabilities from the what they can do, but also very narrow uh, or very sparse coverage of your actual organization. And then this can lead to the worst case scenario which is if you're on a bug bounty system and you think you're getting bug bounties um, and people just aren't submitting um, because you're secure, that creates a, the false sense of security. So you have to manage bug bounties and people who interact with your system, which can be quite hard when they're all over the world. And another thing that complicates it is hacker heterogeneity. I can never say that word as well. It's just a fancy academic word for diverse. Every hacker is different. Some people are really good at SQL injection. Some people are very good at cross-site scripting, I'm good at neither. Um, but this kind of plays into what you need to understand of people that are interacting with your company, that some people are jack-all-trades and some people are one-trick ponies. So one survey kind of did a big survey, uh, did eight, analyzed 82 bug bounty programs and 2,500 uh, bug bounty hunters and identified three archetypes. So you have... Um, this triangle, which is adapted from the survey. You've got your specific hackers up here, and they're people that focus on one project, usually due to um, they like the product or they like the organization. Then you have your non-specific, which is very self-explanatory. They don't pick to one specific organization. They'll go across and do one kind of methodology across many, um, many organizations on these ecosystems. Then you get your less active in the corner. So this is the main, this is your 97.5% which we talked about earlier. These people are rarely submitting bug bounties and if they are, they're getting one and that's them done. So the non-specific or the motivation for these is obviously bounties for non-specific people, but for specific ones, it's got to be more extrinsically focused. They care about actually getting rewarded off the company beyond money. They want to be 
in the Hall of Fame. They want to know their security team. They want to have a personal communication with them. And when you don't do that, you risk the chance of them selling it to the black market, which is quite um, common in a survey that has been done, I think, a year ago. So going back to the non-specific ones, they're most focused on money. And this is where we're going to dabble in our second economic theory when it comes to bug bounties, and that is a sort of St. Petersburg paradox. Basically, this is just fancy terms for uh, only taking in the expected value, you will do stupid decisions. Um, as a student, I can say I've done that many times, hence why I got the mega bus down last night and get it back up tonight. Can't afford a plane. Um, when it comes to bug bounties, this means that we will think that if we go to a well that everybody's been to, or a site, an organisation, then we're not going to get money. There's not enough water at the well kind of thing. Um, and to kind of show this, I've, what I've done here is I've staggered these two reports. There are just uh, examples. So this top one is GitHub, and this bottom one is Slack. And if we take it, for example, that the Slack bug bounty came out first, um, there's a big spike. This is a St. Peter's paradox. And then we have the second one. It starts a week later or whatever. You can see how that dies off. And then this one then picks up. This happens across your hacker one is bug crowds. People jump to all the programs and therefore you have a big windfall and then everybody goes away because they're struggling to retain um, active vulnerability. People submitting vulnerabilities um, kind of regularly. So mostly this happens to non-specific hunters is because they believe that obviously they want money, so they believe that portfolio diversification outweighs the return on investment for adopting a new methodology, which is straight out of Grammarly Premium. Um, so now going on to kind of the conclusion of this, this basically can be seen, these two things I brought up, the Simpsons Paradox, the Hacking Worldwide, and Information Mishmash, can be seen as a consequence of gig economy, because we chase the money, we want to submit first, we don't want to deal with duplications, it can also be seen as the downside of hit, of the diversity of hackers because we think that we're not good enough, the imposter syndrome, that we're not going to find a vulnerability that someone hasn't found first. And then also poor bug bounty management on the side of people who organise it. They're not interacting with the community. They're not having a correspondence and they don't retain participants. So is there a solution to all of this in academic research? The answer to that is no. Um, no one really knows. The, they've suggested things, but as you can imagine, one, getting data off of um, bug bounty companies is quite hard because it's security related. And they don't want to rock the boat. They're getting quite a nice pay right now. And a lot of people are interested in bug bounty, so there's no reason they want to make it better. Um, but what they kind of experiment, well, academic kind of said is incentivize scope creep. So this is just the gamification of the St. Peter's paradox. Every week we'll release a different part of our organization that you get, um, we'll just do like limited releases. So one week it will be one subdomain, the next week we'll increase the scope. Um, another one is private programs, because obviously if you're increasing the scope every week, when you, that means that some parts of your website aren't being checked at all until very later on. So you do private programs to make up for that. But private programs cost a lot of money because you're getting the best hackers on a premium to come and test yours over what they usually do. And then it could be totally something totally different because we don't actually know of anything because no one's ever implemented or experimented on security bug bounties. But there is hope. There may be a solution which is yet to be discovered or been discussed in the open. This could all be privy behind Silicon Valley's closed doors. Um, so going on to references, that's kind of the work cited for the talk. Um, there's two kind of names I kind of want to put out here. So Zhao, number seven, and I think he's up uh, number nine as well. This guy is the only person that I know who's got a PhD in bug bounties. That's where all the economic theory comes from because I wasn't smart enough to think of it myself. Um, and then you've got this one, number five, which is an interview with Katie, the one with the pink hair that you would have seen talk about vulnerabilities, uh, bug, my bug bounties before. Um, these are really good ones to kind of look over and discuss because they're the more cutting edge of everything that I've referenced here. Um, that said, there is massive potential for further academic research into bug bounties, although um, it's, as I've said, it's quite hard to get data and then therefore hard to come to reasonable conclusions. That wraps up my ramblings. Hopefully you've been left with some ongoing problems. I've been Jamie. Thanks for having me.
Any questions? Thanks for the for the presentation and uh, for a review of, of actually the ecosystem from both sides. The participant and the the company actually taking the back bounty. Um, what's your view on um, actually possibly on a statement that basically the back bounties are also misunderstood as a method of of improving security and misunderstood by the participants themselves, not just because obviously the companies have fear. Should, is that something? Am I ready for it? You know, should I let it go? Um, but th there is also, it seems, uh, misunderstanding in how basically the participants approach the back bounties and how that translates later. It's a you know, self-fulfilling prophecy and a, and a vicious loop. What, what's your view on this one? So I would probably say that the marketing about bug bounties and how we kind of see it in the community is like something really cool to brag about and to look at is quite harmful because we jump on it and we think that all these aspiring people come through uni, that's the path they should go down if they want to be a pen tester. And then for companies, they think it is a solution to pen testing. We don't need pen testers if we've got all these people on the internet supposedly hacking or trying to hack us. Um, and it's, as you said, it's like a vicious circle of potential people just not understanding. But well, you should be there to, um, to provide supplementary security to mature organizations. If you're not, um, if you're not mature, if you've not been around, you don't have an internal security team, then there's no point to run a bug bounty at all. Um, and when it comes to pen testers and people who want to be pen testers, yeah, it's good. You get to learn and try your trade, but um, it's not something to really hang your hat on as a normal job. Question on the right. I will get my steps in. Hello. Uh, thanks for the talk. Hi, Sam. Hello, Jamie. Uh, yeah, I was just... No, I have no idea who this guy is. <laughs> Ouija. Uh, right, yeah, I was just wondering, um, do you think overall that the way the bug bounty systems currently are, are a good thing? Like, on the scale that they're being used currently? Or do you think they should be kind of pulled back and maybe tested a bit more before being deployed on such a massive scale? I think if you don't test them in the public, then you're never going to get an actual potential what it's going to be like and eventually. Um, what we've got right now is like 6% of, um, of the Forbes 2000. And if they want to get the rest or a majority of that, then it's got to be worked out right now and ironed out kinks and people have got to adapt or implement it. I think it will be interesting to see the kind of widespread of it because it's mostly Western companies that are implementing bug bounties right now. And we've yet to see if like any other kind of cultures, if they agree to it, which is kind of an interesting take on it. Um, overall, I think it's doing okay as long as we don't kind of buy into all the oh, marketing propaganda pumped out as of late. There's also other kind of interesting companies. So like I spoke to Cobalt at InfoSec today. They do pen testing as a service, which kind of, they transitioned away from bug bounties to doing pen testing as a service, which kind of makes a happy medium. Um, however, you're losing out on the potential skill set of bug bounties. Yeah, true. Cool, thanks. Other questions? <laughs> hey, do you all know each other? Is that the deal? Okay. Yeah, I recognize the shirts. Hi, James. Hi, Jamie. Um, senior solutions part of your slide, if you go back one. Yeah. And you've got your private programs. Yeah. See, when you were answering Sam's question, you were saying the best way for a company to yeah. understand their weaknesses is to add, like, the kind of let it into the wild. Adding a private program in, are we going to see more of an increase in like the kind of Epic Games scenario where we have exclusive kind of companies taking on this kind of thing and then we're going to have, they're maybe not going to get that accurate because it's very targeted based yeah. on the testers they bring in. But what's the difference if in a private program and then doing pen testing as a service? Um, when you're doing private programs, you're getting the best people and it is known for these private programs before they go public that they'll leave the low hanging fruit so the community can come in and still take some part of the cake. Um, when it comes to private programs as well, you're paying a ridiculous amount of money for the people that we know drive fancy blue cars and post about it on Twitter. Um, that's just a kind of problem with it. It has to be public so you get the full diversity of people that hack. Thanks. And with that, everyone who doesn't know Jamie, 
Give them a round of applause and everyone who does Hi. give them a round of applause and buy a mobile. <laughs>